resources and what's going on both in the, count, in the county, the state, and even in our country. Um, I want to thank all of today's esteemed speakers and those that have traveled some uh, great distances to be here. First, Attorney General Grabir Grewal. Um, First Assistant Attorney General Davenport and all our partners at the Attorney General's Office and the Division of Criminal Justice. Um, Deputy Attorney General Bryn Whittle. She's a special assistant to the Attorney General on community engagement and worked intimately with First Assistant Greg Muller to organize this uh, program. Dave Leonardis. He's a confidential assistant with the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. Director Rachel Weiner Apter of the Division of Sim Civil Rights from the Office of the Attorney Generals. Raul Agrawal of the United States Attorney's Office. And then First Assistant Greg Muller and Chief Thomas McCormick from the Sussex County Prosecutor's Office. Um, we also have representatives here tonight, Willie Tolba of Congresswoman Sherrill's office and Cheryl Kraus from Congressman Gottheimer's office. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, who are not here today, but I have been talking to them over the past weeks about these informations, are all of our legislators from the 24th District, including Senator Oraho and then Assemblyman Space and Worths. I want to thank our freeholders for their support, and particularly um, Director Patillo, who was just named um, Director of the Sussex County uh, Freeholder Board uh, this past week, uh, for being here this evening. Um, and then all of our other freeholders, Deputy Director Fantasia, Hertzberg, Yardley, and Fasano. Our police chiefs, who most of them would have been here this evening, however, this evening is the swearing in of a new police chief um, in the town of Newton, so that's where they are today for his um, swearing in. But I do want to thank them, the station commander, our sheriff, and all the Sussex County law enforcement officers. Um, the New Jersey Herald gets a little special shout out for advertising for us, for making the announcement and covering this important event. The message we stress tonight and every day is that Sussex County has no tolerance for hate or hateful or biased crimes. It is the sad day that this symposium is even necessary. But across our nation, state, and county, we can see how the views of a few small number of hateful people has grown into a period of our history where our neighbors, our associates, friends, relatives, acquaintances are forced to live in fear. It is something that we as a country, state, and county must unite against, stand up to, and fight. I read an article yesterday written by Clifford Kulwin, a rabbi emeritus at the Temple B'nai Abraham in Livingston. It was a, an article with regards to what it's like to live in today's society, especially our Jewish brothers and sisters in a time of fear and with this hate that's going on. But he summed up or closed his article with, prejudice is everyone's enemy. Hopefully, those we entrust with the responsibility to lead us recognize that and will spare no effort in keeping America safe and a nurturing place for all who call it home. On behalf of the Sussex County Prosecutor's Office, all the Sussex County law enforcement agencies, the Attorney General and all of our state law enforcement partners, the U.S. Attorney's Office and all of our federal partners, we are here to affirmatively acknowledge our sacred duty to protect and serve everyone and to let you all know that hate has no place in our country, no place in our state, and no place here in Sussex County. I hope this evening, by listening to our speakers, that you learn something and continue to reach out to us in my office for information, because you're gonna learn about reporting and learn with uh, contact people. Contact us, let us know. You know, I, I know Greg has a, uh, a slide up there, and it's been going on for years, going back to the days of um, actually bombing-type terrorism. See something, say something. But it really goes beyond see something, say something. It's hear something, say something. Because an awful lot is passed on by verbal information. And you may hear it, and it may not lead to charges, and it may not lead to anything that there was an actual hate. But if we don't know about it, and we can't cull all that information together, it's impossible for us to react 
or be proactive. I also don't want this to be a night where you simply learn some names, you learn some phone numbers, and you go home. I want you all now to be part of our team, our par part of the team that will no longer tolerate hate. We will not allow those with those type of views to instill fear in our citizens in our community. You are now a member of our team, eradicate, a, a team to eradicate hate, bias, and fear, and to continue this essential dialogue with us each and every day. Because it will take the efforts of all of us to defeat it. Because unfortunately, a few and those with hatred in their hearts can cause an awful lot of damage. But us, as a unit, are much more powerful. So thank you for coming this evening. It now gives me a great honor to introduce our Attorney General, Gerbeer Grewal. The Attorney General has dedicated most of his professional life to helping others and our law enforcement communities. He has been a steadfast supporter of community-involved initiatives to address, among other things, resident and community safety. Since being sworn in as our 61st Attorney General on January 16, 2018, he has continued to encourage the 21 county prosecutors and our counties in our individual bias crime initiatives. The AG is not only a state leader in this cause, but a national leader as well. Just this past Sunday, he marched in solidarity with our Jewish brothers and sisters over the Brooklyn Bridge in a no hate, no fear march. But the actions of the Attorney General go back to day one when he was sworn in as Attorney General. And in fact, in March 26, 2018, he issued a guideline on the dissemination of investigative tips and leads received from the New Jersey public and law enforcement with our New Jersey SARS, the New Jersey Suspicious Activity Reporting System. Now that related mostly to, or when it first came out, to terrorism. But that's what this is. Biased crimes are terrorism. That is what their purpose is. And that unit, and that SARS reporting system, its main purpose is to ensure that all law enforcement are able to share information across the state almost instantaneously upon reporting so that we can learn trends that are going on. The Attorney General is also an active member of our Interfaith Advisory Council along with the County Prosecutors Association of New Jersey. On April 5, 2019, the General also issued a, re a revised bias incident investigation standards to ensure best practices are being used throughout this state to investigate biased crimes and ensure that they are properly charged and indicted and people are brought to justice. Attorney General was also the initiator of the 2121 program, ensuring that all 21 county prosecutors continue their long history of community outreach, but coming up with specific topics for us to cover each year to improve relationships between law enforcement and the communities that we serve. Prior to becoming Attorney General, Attorney General Grewal was the Bergen County Prosecutor, and we worked together there, again, with the County Prosecutors Association in New Jersey. From 2010 to 2016, he was an Assistant United States Attorney in the Criminal Division of the United States Attorney's Office in the District of New Jersey, he also served as an AUSA in the Criminal Division of the attorney, um, U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of New York from 2004 to 2007. He graduated cum laude with a Bachelor of Science from Georgetown in 1995 and received his law degree from the College of William and Mary in 1999. It is with great honor that I introduce my colleague, my friend, and our Attorney General, Gervier Grewal. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor and a privilege. I'm going to actually walk around because it's hard to stand behind that podium and see everybody. Um, it's really an honor and a privilege for me to join you this evening. I want to thank Francis for that incredibly kind introduction and for putting this event together. Uh, for those of you uh, in Sussex County, uh, you have a terrific prosecutor. 
Francis and I were colleagues together when I was a county prosecutor in Bergen, and now I have the privilege of working with him nearly on a daily basis in his current capacity as Sussex County Prosecutor. Last year, he also served with distinction as a president of our County Prosecutors Association of New Jersey. So I want to thank Francis for his leadership and for putting this event together uh, this evening. I always learn something when I go to these events. We have a, a, quite a collection uh, of speakers this evening. Uh, and I learned for the first time, Dave, that you don't work for me directly, that you work for Homeland Security and are on loan uh, through that introduction. So I don't feel guilty when we send you out uh, on overtime uh, after hours now. Um, but we have a, a terrific panel, and what I thought I would do is sh just share with you some of my observations about the recent uh, spike in bias and hate incidents that we're seeing across New Jersey and across the country, and talk to you about some of the things that we're doing about it here in New Jersey, and talk about ways in which each of you can get involved, as Francis said, by being part of the team that's, that works together to eradicate uh, hate and bias in our state. And when I want to give an overview uh, of any type of law enforcement issue, I think it's helpful to look at the statistics, to look at the numbers. Our state police, through our Regional Operations Intelligence Center, do a terrific job of collecting data. And that directive we sent out in April of 2019, which tightened up the reporting of suspicious activity reports, has helped us get a better sense of what's going on in this state when it comes to the landscape of bias and hate incidents. So if we went back to 2017, we had 549 reported incidents of hate and bias in New Jersey. In 2018, that number went to 569. The 2019 numbers are not quite yet finalized, but as of the third quarter of 2019, we had over 700 incidents. Those numbers in and of themselves are troubling. But as a career prosecutor, as someone who wakes up thinking about public safety, goes to bed thinking about public safety, the most alarming trend of many in, in that data is the fact that almost 50%, almost 50% of the known offenders in 2018 were juveniles. And what's even more troubling is that a vast majority of those incidents occurred on school campuses. And these incidents run the gamut. When I, when I look at those nearly 700 incidents that took place in 2019, they run the gamut from anti-Semitic graffiti on a school wall to the harassment of a motorist by a fellow motorist to property crimes that have been motivated by hate or bias to physical assaults that were motivated by hate and bias. And I think we saw the very worst of these offenses last December in Jersey City. What we saw in Jersey City was a horrific act of domestic terrorism by two individuals who were motivated by anti-Semitism and motivated by strong anti-law enforcement beliefs. And they took the life of Detective Joseph Seals, a Jersey City police officer, a father of five, and then they went on to take the lives of three other individuals at the Jersey City Kosher supermarket. Mindy Ferenz, Moshe Deutsch, and Miguel Rodriguez. And when I think about that event, a lot of things go through my mind. You know, I'm privy to a lot of information in that investigation, some of which has been made public, some of which has not yet been made public. But it's troubling to me how someone gets to that point in their life where they want to act on those beliefs and take somebody else's life simply for the way they worship or the job that they do. And I had a number of experiences in the aftermath of the Jersey City terrorist attacks that have really shaken me and really motivated me even more. And I hope motivate each of you to redouble your efforts as you leave here to do what you can to eradicate hate and bias. One of the most profound and moving experiences that I had in the wake of Jersey City was sitting with the widow of Miguel Rodriguez just a day or two after he was killed. And as I went to visit her in her apartment, I sat down with her, and before I could even utter a word to her, through a translator, she said to me, I forgive the killers. I forgive them. 
Because if I filled my heart with hate, there would be no room for love in my heart. And I want love in my heart so I can love the memory of my husband and so I can love our 11-year-old daughter. I don't want to waste my time on hating anybody. But can you answer me a question? Why would anybody, why would anybody hate the Jewish people? They gave my family an opportunity. We came to this country with nothing. We were professionals back home. I was a social worker and my husband was an engineer. But we had lost our jobs and in search of a better life and more opportunity for our family and our 11-year-old daughter, now 11-year-old daughter, we left everyone to come here. And when no one else would take us in, the Jewish community took us in. They gave my husband a job. They allowed for him to work so I wouldn't have to work so I could raise our daughter. And when they took us in when no one else would, they just showed us such tremendous love. And how can people hate an entire community of people who have done nothing but shown love to us? I didn't have any answers for her in that moment. But she challenged me to do something about it. And I left there, and, I, and every time I've met with her since, we've talked about it, about what we can do together to eliminate that type of anti-Semitism, those types of horrible, horrible beliefs. And that's something that's really pushing me as we have these town halls, as we have these meetings, as we have these listening sessions to deal with this issue. The other experience from Jersey City that is also motivating me, and I hope will motivate each of you, is the experience I had about a week after the shootings. I went, along with a number of other public officials and law enforcement officials, to the site of the supermarket. And as the colonel of the state police and I were standing outside the supermarket, trying to process what had taken place there, we looked up, and we looked at a window, and there were young, smiling children waving down at us. And when we figured out what was up there, it was a, a, a yeshiva, a Jewish school, with young students in it. And so we decided to peel off from all the other public officials and other law enforcement officials who were on this visit with us, and we went up to that school. And as we made our way up the stairway, we met the rabbi who ran the school. And we asked the rabbi about the children and how they were doing. There were several dozen young boys in that classroom overlooking the street at the time of the shooting. And he told us that the kids were resilient, that they experienced such horror when they were pinned down in that small room for several hours while that shootout took place only yards away from them. But they bounced back because they were shown so much love, so much love by by community members, by law enforcement, by so many people who showed up to show support for them. And we asked if we could meet with the young students. And the rabbi led us into that classroom. And as he opened the door, the colonel and I walked in, and unprompted, unscripted, each of those young boys got up and started clapping. Can you imagine that? A week removed from a gunfight that took place right outside their window, these young kids started clapping and gave a standing ovation to the two of us. And they weren't clapping for me. They were clapping for that French blue uniform and the triangles on it and what it represented. They were clapping for the first responders, the men and women of law enforcement, who prevented such horrible tragedy from becoming something unimaginable. And that was deeply moving to me. We were right before the holiday season, and what I saw before me, and I've said it before, were dozens and dozens of tiny little holiday miracles. And as I looked through the window of that yeshiva, I saw another school right across the street. And then I thought about the hundreds of miracles that were in the larger elementary school across the street. Listen, I think we owe it to those several dozen young boys in that yeshiva, and to the children all around who were spared that day, to do everything we can to ensure that they grow up in a society where they can live their faiths freely, 
that they don't have to worry about wearing a kippah or a turban or a hijab while they're walking down the street, that they don't have to worry about being targeted because of their faith, that they don't have to worry about their security as they sit through a school day. And it's easy to get down on yourselves and, and, and feel a little bit helpless. But I think there are certainly things that we can do, that things that we must do in this moment right now, because it has brought us together. Those domestic terrorists wanted to strike fear in the heart of Jersey City, in the heart of the Jewish community, in the heart of the state, in the heart of this country, and divide people. But guess what? What I've seen over the last number of weeks are people standing shoulder to shoulder with no space between them, law enforcement, faith leaders, community leaders, all coming together and saying, not here, not in our state. So what do we do? I think a couple of things that come to mind. I can think of a couple of things. First, Francis, myself, all the law enforcement officers and prosecutors, we have to do whatever we can to hold accountable those that commit these acts of domestic terrorism. We have a domestic terrorism statute in this state. We have strong tools. We have strong allies and partners in the federal level. And we have to bring all of our resources, as we are right now, to bear on those who engage in this type of conduct to send a strong message of deterrence, that we will not tolerate this. That's the first thing. That's first and foremost in the aftermath of any horrific event like this. The second thing, I think we all have to be mindful, all of us, regardless of whether you have a public platform or whether you're just an ordinary citizen in your place of employment. We all have to be mindful of our rhetoric. We all have to be conscious of the words we use. Listen, I know there are so many divisive topics in the world right now when it comes to immigration, when it comes to Second Amendment issues, when it comes to all manner of issues. We could debate those in a civilized manner. We could debate those without resorting to ad hominem attacks. We could debate those in a respectful way. What we should not ever tolerate is in the context of those debates, when people dehumanize other people, when people use such disparaging language to refer to human beings. Because I have seen as a prosecutor, not just in these incidents, but incidents that I've investigated and prosecuted throughout my career, how comments do lead to conduct. How comments push those people who might be on the edge to hateful conduct. I saw it as a county prosecutor when we prosecuted two individuals who went on a five synagogue bombing spree between 2011 and 2012. It just started with comments. It's just kids being kids. Guess what? It ended up with them trying to firebomb a wooden synagogue in Rutherford because they couldn't burn down a brick and mortar synagogue. Comments do lead to conduct. When we see hateful conduct, we all have an obligation to call it out and be more responsible in our rhetoric. The third thing, again, for teachers, for educators, for parents, you have to demand more of your schools and you have to demand more of law enforcement when it comes to dealing with youth bias. When we have youth bias incidents in schools, it cannot just be a slap on the wrist. When a kid paints a swastika on a bathroom wall in a school, it can't just end with a promise not to do it again. That could be symptomatic of something bigger happening in that particular school or in that community. You know, when I was a county prosecutor, we would have incidents of sexting where it, kids sent pictures to each other, and it was a whole of community response. Parents were notified. I was notified as a county prosecutor. We sent our computer crimes unit there to wipe the phones. There were school assemblies that were held to talk about where this could lead. Why should the response to incidents of hate and bias and anti-Semitism be any less? Why shouldn't we warn these young people where these hateful ideologies can lead them? About where these paths can take them? That's the third thing that we must all do. The fourth thing, I think, comes down to the school curricula that we have in place right now. You know, our, our director of our Division on Civil Rights, Rachel Wayner Apter, is here. She's been holding listening sessions as part of the Governor's Youth Bias Task Force across the state. And one thing has become apparent. 
We do a great job in our schools of preparing our kids for tests, preparing them on math and science and about the tests they'll face and standardized exams down the road. But are we doing enough to teach them how to be good, thoughtful human beings? Because we can't control what happens at every dinner table. But we can control what happens in the schools. And we can make sure that they get, that they get good, positive messaging in the school system. And I hope the Youth Bias Task Force, when they come back with their recommendations, will come back with recommendations on how we could improve our curricula when it comes to these types of issues in our schools. The final thing I'll leave you, leave you with is about social media. When we published our bias crimes report for 2017 and 2018, we did something more than we ever did before. We did a deep dive to root causes on why are we seeing some of these alarming trends. And one of the things we identified were the, the algorithms that various social media companies use. These are algorithms that push you to people who think like you. That if you like certain things, they'll push you to other people who like those same certain things. This is how they make their money. And this is also where people with hateful ideologies find community. Because it is very difficult to express anti-Semitic thoughts on a street corner, to express other types of hateful thoughts on a street corner and hope people congregate around you. But the anonymity of the internet where people hide behind screen names, where they troll other people anonymously, where these algorithms push people to find each other, and where they feel a semblance of normalcy, that's got to stop. We've got to do what we can at our level to make sure that social media companies are acting responsibly. But parents, and this is being part of the team, parents need to talk to their kids about the dangers that are on the internet, not just about the dangers of online predators that might target them uh, to take sexual advantage of them, but these other online predators who are trying to recruit people to be a part of these, these hate groups that we also see rising in this particular moment. Now, the speakers behind me are going to give you all sorts of information about what constitutes a bias incident, what constitutes a bias crime, on how to report it. And they're going to give you the details and the nuts and bolts of how we do some of these investigations. That's great. But don't worry about distinguishing between a bias incident and a bias act. Will it matter if I report it? Report it. If you're thinking about it, report it. As Francis said earlier, it might fit into something else we're looking at. Or it might save somebody's life. I'll give you an example. One of the listening sessions I had was at Rutgers. And I met with a group of, of students there. And a young gentleman said to me, listen, I was walking uh, by a frat party the other night. And as I was walking by, uh, somebody looked at me and they saw my kippah, my yarmulke. And they started saying to each other, well, we should go beat him up. They were drunk, they were high. We should go F him up. And one of the other students there who was with them on that, that porch said, no, don't do that. Come on, guys. And I said, that's awful. Did you report it? He said, no. I said, you were lucky that there was one voice of reason on that porch, but what about the next kid who walks behind you who they might want to target and that person's not there? What about him? We have to report these incidents. You know, our numbers went up almost 300% after we improved our reporting requirements. And, and these crimes are underreported to begin with. These incidents are underreported to begin with. And I know when we look at national statistics, New Jersey seems like it's got a problem that other places don't have. This problem is everywhere. We're reporting it better. We're tracking it better. And we're encouraging people to report it more. And those are all good things because it allows all of us here in law enforcement at the state to do our jobs to make sure we protect all of our communities. So as you leave here, do your part. As Francis said, be part of the team. I think we owe it to those young people whose lives were spared. We owe it to make sure that they can live their lives freely. And I'll leave you with one final thought, which keeps uh, me going sometimes when I do end up feeling helpless about 
this issue and others, but particularly this issue. And these are the words of Nelson Mandela. Mandela, in his long walk to freedom, put it best. He said that no one is born hating another person. This is him after he experienced apartheid and spent nearly 30 years in jail. No one is born hating another person because of the color of their skin, their religion, or their background. People must learn to hate. And if they could learn to hate, they can be taught to love. Because love comes much more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. That's the message that Miguel Rodriguez's widow was teaching me. That's the message I've taken away over the events of the last month and a half. And I hope that's the message that you take with you as you leave here today. Thank you. Next up will be the director from the Division of Civil Rights. But I'm going to go a little out of order because I'm not used to starting these events right in the beginning. Usually I have someone else do the introduction. But I'm going to ask you all to rise so that we can say the Pledge of Allegiance um, and then have a moment of silence. moment of silence for all those that we have lost in law enforcement and our community members to bias and hatred. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Prosecutor Koch, for inviting me here, and thank you um, to the Attorney General for sharing um, those beautiful words. Um, I am Rachel Weiner apter the Director of the State's Division on Civil Rights. Uh, the Division on Civil Rights enforces the New Jersey Law Against Discrimination, which you might never have heard of, but it is the oldest state civil rights statute in the country. It was enacted in 1945, and it is still one of the broadest civil rights statutes in the country. It prevents acts of bias and hate and prejudice and discrimination in employment, in housing, and in places of public accommodation. Um, and I'm here specifically because Many things that are reported as a bias incident could be a violation of the law against discrimination or could be both a bias crime and a violation of the law against discrimination. Um, and so I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about what our division does and when to um, send someone to our division um, if they have experienced a bias incident. Um, so as the Attorney General um, spoke about, it seems like we wake every morning to additional reports in the news of a swastika painted on a school wall, or racial harassment at a football game, or bias or hate crimes. Um, in a case of bias-based harassment that occurs in employment or housing or a place of public accommodation like a school, um, a criminal investigation would look at who was the individual perpetrator, who was the individual who was involved in the incident, and did that incident rise to the level of a crime? Um, a civil rights investigation, when someone files a complaint with our office or when we proactively investigate with, which, with what is called a director-initiated complaint, um, our investigation does not look at the, only at the individual who is involved. Instead, it looks at the institution and whether the institution took the steps necessary to address if there was a school climate, for example, um, of religious discrimination or if there was a school climate of religious harassment, if there was um, underlying issues in the school of racism or of racial harassment. Did the school know or should it have known about that? And if so, what did it do to address it? So what steps did it put into place, either as remedial measures after an incident or even more importantly, in order to prevent an incident beforehand? And when someone files a civil rights complaint with my office, um, unlike a criminal prosecution, the person can get 
um, money damages, um, and affirmative um, equitable relief. So things like a new policy, new training requirements for the teachers at the school or the people who work for the employer, a new policy regarding how issues of bias and um, harassment will be handled, um, and the and equitable relief um, of similar kinds. And we don't only do um, civil rights investigations because those are, um, are only reacting after something has happened. We are charged by the law against discrimination with preventing and eliminating discrimination and harassment in the state of New Jersey. Um, and we can't do that if we are only reacting after an incident has occurred. And so a big part of our work is trying to work with communities on how to prevent acts of bias and hate um, to begin with. And the Attorney General spoke um, a lot about that already, but I will add just a few more things um, that we have done in this area. Area. So one, um, as the Attorney General mentioned, is looking at if it's, for example, an incident in a school, what is the whole school approach? Um, has the school looked at whether this is symptomatic of something that is going on with more than just this one isolated incident? And if so, who can they bring in as a speaker? What type of programming can they create? How can they bring students together to create programming? Because at the um, youth bias listening sessions that the Attorney General mentioned that we've been holding across the state, one one of the most inspiring things that we have heard about is students who have started clubs in their high schools and even one student came and talked about a club she started in her middle school called the Ambassador Club that was designed to bring students together where they might not otherwise be um, interacting on a daily basis, either because of their cultural background, their national origin, what religion they um, practice, and so really bringing students together to try to do a climate survey of the school and to try to figure out what type of programming would make everyone at school feel more comfortable and would make everyone at the school feel more included. Um, so that is one of the um, proactive approaches that we have been working on. Another, as the Attorney General mentioned, was the bias incident report. The Division on Civil Rights did do, um, as the AG mentioned, this deep dive into what are the root causes of um, a lot of the bias incidents that we're seeing. And three things that I wanted to mention when it comes to um, social media that we have seen is um, social media allows people to be radicalized in the privacy of their own homes, whereas previously you would have had to come out of your home and attend a physical meeting um, in order to find others with similar beliefs. People can now become radicalized from the privacy of their own basement. Um, saying some people feel very comfortable saying things online and with the anonymity of um, the internet that they would never say um, person to person. Um, and algorithms are not only putting people together, but they're actually, the way that the algorithms work for a lot of the social media companies is that they're making it seem like hate is much more prevalent than it really is. Because if you make a statement that is extremely inflammatory and a lot of people comment on it, it will then move to the top of other people's news feeds because it has those comments. And so to other people, it seems like it is more prevalent and that more people think that, but really it's just that it is coming to the top of their news feed um, because it has garnered this type of attention. Um, and then two other things that I wanted to mention, in terms of the Youth Bias Task Force, we have held these community listening sessions across the state um, where people have come and have shared their perspectives on what needs to be done to address bias in schools. And, the, and so that has included suggestions like anti-bias education, as the Attorney General mentioned. Um, and then it has also included suggestions like really looking at um, institutional racism and how that has existed for many years years before this uh, most recent rise in bias incidents and a lot of other, we've heard fantastic feedback really all across the state. Um, we have also set up a mechanism for people to submit written feedback. So if you have ideas for what you think schools need to be doing, what you think the state needs to be doing, what you think communities need to be doing to address bias, especially among students and in schools, um, I would be very, very grateful if you could send an email to forums 
at njcivilrights.gov. Um, or if you go to the njcivilrights.gov website, there is a written comments form, and so you could submit your written feedback online as well. But the email, once again, is forums, F-O-R-U-M-S, at njcivilrights.gov. Um, and then one other thing, um, something that has come up at a number of the task forces and that does give me hope um, when I think about the times that we are living in right now is that this is not only an issue that institutions can address, this is really an issue that every single one of us can address every single day. Um, and so I'm going to offer three suggestions for how um, we can all do that. So one is to pledge to stand up to hate um, whenever you hear it or whenever you see it. We've all probably been part of conversations that um, it were, that we did not like what we were hearing, but it would have been very awkward to get involved. And so we have probably all been in situations where we have chose to, chosen to look the other way or not hear um, something that we did hear. And I think that we can really all pledge to um, stand up and say something and to be um, an ally in situations when we hear someone who is being um, othered or who is being harassed um, in some way. I think number two, um, I have an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 6-year-old, and I think really, really seriously about how to make sure that I'm teaching my children that all people, it sounds so basic, but that all people are created equal, and all people are equally entitled to dignity and respect. And that seems like something that has really just gotten lost in recent years. And um, as the Attorney General mentioned, no one is born hating another person because of what they look like or because of who they love or because of where they come from or because of what they believe. Um, but our children learn things from the media. They learn things from hearing their friends talk at school. They learn things from um, hearing others talk on the street and they really pick up so many messages um, of hate and of persistent othering um, from all different sources, and so we can all really pledge to um, teach our children, as I said, that all children are created um, equally and are equally entitled to dignity and respect. Um, and then a third thing is that we can all pledge to plan an interfaith event with your um, congregation or with your church or with your synagogue or plan a multicultural event in your community. Um, one of the things that we've learned in the listening sessions is how communities have really stood shoulder to shoulder, not only in response to biased crimes, but just as a way to get to know each other. Um, because as Dr. Martin Luther King said, um, people fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other, and they don't know each other because they have never actually truly come together to take the time to talk to each other. And so that is something that we can all be involved in every day. Um, reach out, make a connection, um, and hopefully that is something that can spread from here. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Muller. I'm the first assistant prosecutor in Sussex County. And first off, I just want to thank all of you for coming out. I, I got to be honest, I was a little bit nervous about tonight. It's, it's midweek, uh, right after the holidays, late at night, and it was a pretty good turnout. And this is really an important event for us. Uh, it's an important event for the community. And it's important because, as everybody's mentioned, we have seen a rise in bias incidents. We've seen a rise in bias crimes. Um, and, it, and I think everybody here probably understands that there's a growing sense of uh, groupthink, tribalism going on, you know, in the country, and it's, it's unhealthy. Um, the Attorney General talked about a frustration you know, in dealing with this, and, and, and how do we deal with it? What do we do to improve the situation? Um, this is part of it. You guys coming out, you guys caring enough to come out. Um, so I want to thank you for that. Um, 
you know, one, one thing is you're hearing from a bunch of prosecutors and a bunch of lawyers uh, tonight. And we, we can't prosecute our, our way out of this. You know, we do have a problem. We can't litigate our way out of this. We have to uh, come together, care about it, and, and move forward. And what I want to do tonight is, is talk to you about what's going on locally. Uh, the Attorney General talked about some of the statistics statewide. And here locally, we have seen an increase as well in our county. And, you know, we have taken steps to address that. There's actually four areas I want to talk to you about. One is going to be, this is a little dry, I apologize, the difference between a biased crime and a biased incident. Uh, Dave Leonardis with the Attorney General's Office, he's going to talk a little bit more about reporting and statistics. We are running behind. That's what happens when you get a group of lawyers talking. Uh, you will run behind. Uh, so I'm going to skip over some of this. Um, I'm going to talk about the threat within our county and our response here in Sussex County to that threat. And then, as kind of has been the theme of the night, you know, see something, say something, as Prosecutor Koch said. If you hear some, something, say something. We'll give you some contact numbers. Um, all right, so what is a bias incident? It is the act, attempt, or agreement with another to intimidate an individual or group because of race, color, religion, gender, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, national origin, or ethnicity, or causing a, p a person to feel intimidated uh, in one of those categories. When it becomes a crime is when you have that incident, that bias incident, and it's coupled with an act. Homicide, assault, kidnapping, criminal restraint, sex crime, robbery, arson, criminal mischief, burglary, weapon offenses, and the most common thing that we see is harassment. Um, so how does the law deal with that when it is a biased crime? Basically, it, everything gets graded one degree higher. So if the underlying offense was a disorderly person's offense, which is punishable by up to six months in the county jail, it becomes a fourth degree, and that's punishable by up to 18 months. Um, if it's uh, a third degree, it goes to a second degree. First degree, the normal sentencing range is between 10 and 20 years. If it's a biased crime, the exposure is now 15 to 30 years, and there's a non-merger pro provision, and what that means is that the conviction for the bias crime will not merge with the underlying offense. As I mentioned, Dave, Dave's going to talk more about reporting. Yeah, I'm gonna, I, I want to show you guys some pictures. Uh, I'm going to start go, go back to September of 2017. Pictures are disturbing uh, to look at. They've never been seen publicly. Uh, the reason I want to show them to you is because these cases uh, we care about greatly in the office. We have investigated these cases, spent countless hours working on these cases. Um, and I can tell you, we're going to keep working on these cases, and we're not going to stop until the statute of limitations runs or we arrest somebody. So I want to show them to you tonight, and you never know. You know, you may recognize something. You may have seen similar graffiti. Uh, in your neighborhood, and we would like you to give us a call if you have. So back in September of 2017, there was some graffiti uh, at the airport diner. Anybody remember that? In the, um, and so I'll show you those pictures. Very hateful stuff. So we, we did develop some suspects. We, d we don't have enough at this point to go forward. But if anybody in the community has any information, please contact us. Um, shortly after that, we had an incident in September of 2018 with our congressman, Josh Gottenheimer. And that's his campaign sign and a house, right, that displayed the sign. Michael Zaremski, um, there were two cases last year that really got our attention, and it started with uh, this individual, Mr. Zaremski. And one thing I have to tell everybody, 
the case is he's still pending sentencing. He has pled guilty. He's facing up to 12 years in state prison. But I'm going to say allegedly until the case is finally sentenced. Um, everything that I'm about to talk to you about has been publicly disclosed. So, um, Mr. Zaremski uh, is 25 years old. He was an EMT. And by the way, on his EMT uniform, he would wear a patch. RWDS is what it said. It stands for Right Wing Death Squad. And he would wear that when he would go out and treat folks that needed medical care. Um, he had an admiration for Adolf Hitler and Nazis. He sent harassing photographs of Nazi paraphernalia to a uh, Jewish business. Large collection of firearms and assault weapons, some of which were homemade. He talked about shooting up people in a hospital because in his view, they were no longer contributing to society. He had a fascination with mass shootings, and he videotaped himself reenacting aspects of the Christ Church shooting in New Zealand. Um, believed all extreme right-wing mass shooters were heroic. He didn't have any uh, known group affiliation at least that we could find, and he's facing up to 12 years state prison. Um, we had a lot of people look at this case, and I, I think the general consensus was that this was potentially a mass shooting in the making. Um, and we we're very thankful that he got arrested. Uh, shortly after that, we had this guy, Joe Rubino. Again, allegedly, uh, his case, I believe he's pled guilty. It's in the federal system. Uh, he was arrested by happenstance. He happened to crash his car coming back from a gun show, and he had a whole cache of firearms in the back, and that kicked off the investigation. He's 57 years old. He's a former member of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club. Uh, numerous assault weapons in his vehicle. Found 17 more at his, his home, a grenade launcher. Nazi paraphernalia, um, and he frequently appeared at gun shows, and he would sell racist material in, in his firearms. We talked a little bit about, and, and Rachel was just talking about this, uh, you know, the fact that people are just at home, and you don't have to go out to some meeting or gathering anymore. You know, you can just sit behind your computer and, uh, you know, get sucked in to a whole world. Uh, that, that's very unhealthy. I'll give you one example that, that concerns me. Um, anybody here of the Rise Above movement? It's a movement out of Orange County, California. That's where they're based. Now, the Rise Above movement is obviously a problem for Orange County, California. It's a problem for Sussex County, New Jersey also. Because they have a very heavy online presence and they recruit young kids. And if, if you go to their website, what you're going to see is, you know, the promotion of a healthy lifestyle. No drinking, no drugs, work out, stay in shape. They promote themselves as a fight club. A lot of things could be attractive, you know, to a, to a teenage kid. But when you get in, the, the main group in Charlottesville that were on the Nazi side, that was the Rise Above movement. So even a group from all the way out in Orange County, California, is a problem right here in our county. So we have long had a, a, an assistant prosecutor assigned to prosecute biased crimes. We have also had a gang unit, uh, but just recently, after the Zaremski and Rubino cases, we formed a new unit here in Sussex County uh, dedicated solely to these types of cases. Again, see something, say something. And these are some uh, contact numbers. Just call the main number. You can always ask for me. Uh, I handle these cases. We 
have a new detective assigned to the unit, uh, Detective David Spence. Um, and there, there's actually brochures in the back that will have all of this contact information as well. So um, at the state level, can, you guys probably can't read that, right? All right, it's tips at NJ, Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness.gov, NJOHSP.gov, 866-4-SAFE-NJ. And again, th this information will be back on pamphlets in the back. All right. Thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to ask Dave to come on up. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, I'm Dave Leonardis. I'm the training outreach liaison with the Division of Criminal Justice at the Attorney General's Office. And I'd like to thank Prosecutor Koch and the Sussex County Prosecutor's Office for inviting us here tonight. So what I plan on doing is uh, take a few minutes to let you know what the, the Attorney General's guidelines are when it comes to bias incident investigation standards. So the, as the Attorney General Graywall said earlier today, on April 5th of this year, they released the, um, his guidelines on bias investigation standards for law enforcement. So it's the first time that those guidelines have been updated since January 2000. And basically what they focus on, uh, focus on the fact that any bias incident that's reported to law enforcement it's got to have an immediate response. It's got to have a thorough response and a thorough investigation. It's got to, uh, police officers have to render uh, to victim assistance where necessary and do community outreach if, if necessary as well. So it's, it's pretty comprehensive as far as that goes. And in addition to that, it also talks about the fact that police chiefs are supposed to develop their own um, procedures for conducting bias investigations. You know, besides sharing them with their uh, officers on their department, they also are supposed to share them with the community, let the community know what they're all about. And they're very detailed. Uh, the, the procedures in the Attorney General's guidelines are, as I said earlier, very detailed and they don't leave much to the imagination. The, the other thing that uh, the updated guidelines really spelled out is what a bias incident is. And you can see up there that it could be something as simple as name calling, offensive language, inappropriate gestures or behavior, or graffiti. All that raises to the level of a bias uh, incident. Whenever police are called for any of that, they fill out a supplementary bias incident offense report. It's a special report and I'll get into that in a minute. So the guidelines also say is that the officer should be using common sense. And the one thing that we do, we've trained every police department in the state on these new guidelines and the reporting system. Uh, we've also trained all of the bias crime liaisons from the, the uh, local level, county level, state level. And basically what, what we're telling officers, if you're not sure if you're questioning whether it's a bias incident or not. It probably is, so treat it as a bias incident. And that's what's happening. So as you can see, the, the guidelines talk about uh, every bias incident has got to be reported as quickly as possible, but no later than 24 hours using the electronic uniform crime reporting system. So th that's pretty comprehensive in itself. That's what the, the supplementary bias incident offense report looks like. It's pretty, it's very in-depth, you know, and it captures a lot of information. The, the reason why you need to capture information like this is because the fact that, as, he, as Attorney General Graywell said, you know, we need to have a better understanding of what the problem is, what the bias landscape looks like here in Jersey, because that's the only way, you know, you have to know the problem to be able to fix it and come up with resolutions. 
So this system, whenever a police department submits that report through the electronic uniform crime reporting system, it automatically, we just developed this, uh, and on April 15th of this year, it became active. <clears throat> Once they submit that report, it goes to the New Jersey State Police Uniform Crime Reporting Unit. At the same time, it goes to uh, the Division of Criminal Justice Bias Crimes Unit. It goes to the respective county prosecutor's office where the offense occurs. And it also goes to New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. You're going to hear from them shortly. And the reason being, as, as the uh, Attorney General said, sometimes there's a nexus between bias, incidents, and terrorism. The, the other piece of this is that at the end of every business day, all 21 county prosecutors, bias crime liaisons, those detectives and assistant prosecutors that just focus on bias crimes, bias incidents, get a copy of every bias incident that occurs in the state. Uh, reason being, one, it gives them a greater view of the landscape throughout the state. Secondly, it helps connect the dots. You know, since we put this system in place, um, it was only in place in a matter of weeks, we got a call from Union County Prosecutor's Office. They were able to connect 15 bias incidents that were unresolved uh, by using the system that were perpetrated by three individuals that were unrelated to each other. And there's been a lot of other, obviously, a lot of other um, uh, positive results like that. So, um, as I mentioned before, one, we trained all of law enforcement on this, and, and they're using it pretty proficiently. The other thing that we did, and y you heard from the Attorney General talk about the 21 County, uh, 21st Century Community Policing Initiative, where every county prosecutor goes out and talks to uh, their constituents on different things, one of those topics, they have to do four topics a year that the Attorney General and his staff, uh, you know, come up with. One was on bias. So every, every prosecutor spoke about the uh, bias incidents, bias crimes to their constituents. In addition to that, our office, working with our partners in different prosecutors' offices around the state and the New Jersey Bias Crimes Officers Association, have run a lot of training um, statewide for community members like yourselves. And the one thing that I, I see and I hear usually by the end of every session that we've done, somebody will come over and say, you know, I didn't know that, uh, uh, you know, I should report a gesture or a, uh, a bad remark, you know, uh, uh, against me, my religion, uh, my race, to law enforcement. You know, I, I could remember there was a gentleman, an elderly gentleman from uh, um, Cape May came up afterwards. He was a retired educator. And he said that, you know, he said, I've been called the N-word my entire life. I had no idea I should report this to police. So my point is that between the guidelines, the updated guidelines that really spell out in detail what should be reported and leaves no question in the mind of the officer, uh, the reporting system that's put in place, and the fact that the community has been tra has you know been trained, the the numbers are increasing. But you know some of that is because of the times, but some of it is because of the fact that we're all a little bit more aware and better educated in that regard. And you know as as uh, the general mentioned before, you know, the numbers have gone up. I, I know state police will release the numbers uh, within you know the near future. But they're, um, you know, they're well over uh, 900 incidents for the year. The, the other reason that we really stress, and you heard Prosecutor Koch talk about the importance of reporting. And sometimes, you know, uh, the community feels like, well, we don't want to bother police. You know, they have enough to do, but we really, you know, this is too trivial. Right? Uh, just a, a quick... Um, Situation that comes to mind back in the beginning of 2014, uh, where there was a lot of unrest in the Kiev, um, there were Jewish Orthodox rabbis from Lakewood who were 
collecting money to try to get Jews out of the Kiev to a safe location because of all the fighting that was going on. And an individual by the name of uh, Fraser, Glenn Miller, called the uh, one rabbi that was heading up the, you know, the uh, donations and, col and collections and asked the, the rabbi from uh, Lakewood, you know, like, what is this all about? So he, the rabbi explained, and uh, Fraser Glenn Miller then started to proceed to um, really berate the, uh, the rabbi and the Jews and got into some really negative stuff. Um, when the rabbi got off the phone, he talked to some of his counterparts and said, you know, we're used to this, you know, should we report it or shouldn't it? Well, we're used to it, but you know what? The police have their hands full with so many other things and they never reported it. Two weeks later on April 14th, Fraser Glenn Miller, who was a, um, a white supremacist, um, he was part of the KKK and a lot of other groups at different times, had done time in federal prison for hate crimes and was on every law enforcement agency's uh, radar. Um, Miller went out on a Sunday uh, morning to a Jewish community center uh, outside of Kansas and shot and killed three innocent people. So, you know, you, you always wonder what may have happened if it was reported. And that's why we really stress the please report. You're going to hear in a little while from uh, um, the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness, and they're going to be talking about their SARS or suspicious activity reporting system and how important that is. All right, uh, just two more items I'm going to finish up with. One, if a bias incident involves a, um, a homicide, an arson, a aggravated assault or a sexual assault, if the suspected perpetrator is a law enforcement officer, or if there's a potential for large-scale unrest, Local police know that they have to contact the Division of Criminal Justice immediately so that it makes, uh, it allows the Attorney General and the Director of Division of Criminal Justice to be aware of what's going on. The other benefit to it is that the Director, in all uh, cases, in most cases, will get on the phone and talk to the prosecutor. They'll come up with a plan on how to proceed. And lastly, um, if a if a county prosecutor's office has an intent to uh, indict on bias, they, they report it immediately to the Division of Criminal Justice so that the Attorney General and Division of Criminal Justice has visibility on it. And again, so that the director and prosecutor usually, uh, they may talk about how to proceed with the case. So I know um, that's it for me. I know I think at some point we may come back if you have questions, but I thank you for your time. Oh, and lastly, there are flyers out there. Please grab one on your way out. There's flyers that talk about bias incident, bias crime, and, you know, there's uh, an 800 number on here if you ever need to report. And when it comes to reporting, always go to your local police department first. Oh, I just want to make that clear. Thank you. Folks, good evening. Uh, my name is Rahul Agarwal. Uh, I am with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, it, we have offices in Newark, Trenton, and Camden. Um, thank you to Prosecutor Koch. Thank you to uh, Attorney General Graywall. Thank you to you all. Um, I, I, I'm honored to be here and, and, and able to speak to you tonight. Um, you are hearing from a number of prosecutors. Um, the, uh, the indication that you're hearing from a number of prosecutors is that you also are seeing a number of PowerPoint presentations, um, since it's the easiest way, I think, for us to organize our thoughts. So I know we are a little bit over time here. Um, my job is uh, to explain to you a little bit about what the federal tools are uh, that we have at our disposal. Um, what I can tell you is this. Um, we take these threats seriously, um, we uh, investigate them thoroughly, and we work hand in hand with our local uh, and state law enforcement partners. Um, we've been doing that for a number of years and will continue to do so. Um, and I think as evidence of that, we're here tonight, um, but also I'll show you a couple of examples of cases uh, in which we're working hand in hand with the state. So um, I'm let me, let me kind of launch right into this and talk to you. Let's see, there we go, okay. 
Um, so what's a federal hate crime? Um, this one I, I think is self-explanatory, right? But a federal hate crime is a crime motivated by prejudice or bias based on a protected characteristic. Um, and you all can, uh, I think, identify a number of those characteristics. Race, color, um, religion, national origin, um, gender, uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability. Depending on the law that we're, that we're looking at, depending on the statute, um, some or all of those categories might apply. So not every federal statute covers every one of those categories, but a number of them are generally implicated. The main statute that we look at is this one, the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes uh, Prevention Act of 2009. Um, and you, know, you all may or may not remember Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Matthew Shepard um, was killed on account of his sexual orientation. Um, he was gay. Uh, and James Byrd Jr. was an African-American who was dragged through the streets of Texas, I believe, um, and killed on account of his race. Um, uh, as a result of, of those incidents, Congress passed this law, um, which now is really one of our best tools in, in prosecuting um, hate crimes on the federal level. Um, I know the font is a little small, but generally, right, the crime is that you willfully cause bodily injury uh, to a person through the use of fire, a firearm, a dangerous weapon, or an explosive or incendiary device uh, because of the victim's race, color, religion, national origin, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, or disability. And the last thing at the bottom there says affecting interstate or foreign commerce. Um, as you may know, right on the federal level, often we need an interstate commerce link in order to prosecute something. Um, so I listed all of those protected characteristics, all of the ones that were on that first slide. The interstate commerce component only applies to some of them. So, for instance, if, uh, if the offense is a result of someone's race, color, uh, or religion, then you don't really need that interstate commerce requirement. That's enough in and of itself. Um, the penalties here uh, are imprisonment up to 10 years, uh, a fine, and if there's aggravating factors, then you're looking at life imprisonment. Um, aggravating factors can be uh, kidnapping, sexual abuse, things like that. Um, so the key takeaway, right, is um, if there is bodily injury uh, and uh, there is the use of one of these devices, um, we have jurisdiction and we have a hook to prosecute somebody um, if indeed we can show that they were committing this act on account of a protected characteristic. A couple of examples, um, one old and one that's ongoing. Uh, so the one on the left is the older one. Um, again, you, you, may, you may remember this, this is Sayreville, New Jersey. Um, this was uh, a New Year's Eve uh, attack uh, by a number of neo-Nazis, uh, multiple assailants, um, they're armed with knives and brass knuckles, uh, they uh, are drinking on New Year's Eve, they then decide that they are going to go out and attack uh, anyone who's not uh, Caucasian. Um, and so they end up attacking a number of uh, Arabs, um, they're shouting anti-Arab uh, slurs, um, they were members of a white supremacist group called the Aryan Terror Brigade. Um, two of them ultimately uh, were prosecuted, pled guilty, uh, each received 33 months in, in jail. Uh, they were all prosecuted pursuant to the Matthew Shepard and uh, James Byrd Jr. Act. Um, on the right uh, is a case that's ongoing right now. Um, again, you may have seen this one in the news. Uh, the chief of police uh, in Bordentown, New Jersey, uh, it's Frank Nucera. Um, he was charged uh, with, with federal hate crimes. That case is set for trial, uh, retrial later this year. Um, so I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but this is all public. Um, he was alleged, and, and I'll keep saying the word alleged here, alleged to have used derogatory hate speech uh, prior to and during the arrest of an African-American teenager. Um, he was also alleged uh, to have slammed that teenager's head into a metal door jam. Um, and uh, he was charged with a hate crime uh, because the allegation is that um, his conduct with respect to this African-American teenager was uh, as a result of that teenager's race. Um, he is the first police officer in at least 10 years to be charged with a federal hate crime. And as I said, that case is ongoing, but that's a case that our office is prosecuting um, because, as I said, you know, we, we take um, all of these allegations seriously um, and we try our best you know, to make the case to bring a prosecution um, and to seek justice for the victims of these crimes. Um, so the main statute that we have is this one, but there are some others. Um, I'm going to go through these a little bit more quickly, if only because they just come up a little less frequently uh, in terms of cases that we are doing. Um, if you criminally interfere, interfere with the right to fair housing, so there's a statute on point for that. Um, again, if you are intimidating, injuring, or interfering with someone um, who is enjoying a housing right um, uh, because of that victim's race, color, religion, gender, 
handicapped familial status or national origin. Uh, that constitutes a federal offense. Um, again, the penalties are uh, very similar, almost exact to the uh, prior statute. Damage to religious property, um, and this uh, comes up often uh, in cross-burning cases. Uh, you intentionally deface, damage, or destroy any religious real property because of the religious character of that property, um, and then there's this interstate commerce uh, component. The penalties sort of range depending on the, num the amount of injury. Um, it's anywhere from uh, one year to 40 years or life, depending on the circumstances of the, the, of the offense. But on this one, you may remember this uh, case, um, which you know w was was and remains significant um, because of the conduct, because of what happened. Um, I think it's something that sort of struck to the core of, of who we were as human beings. And when this news broke, I think we all took a long time to think about what was happening here. Um, this this man um, who was charged uh, in this case was um, charged with a violation of 18 U.S.C. 247. Now. He was charged with a number of things, so it was, uh, it, it was a multi-count um, indictment, ultimately pled to uh, a number of criminal counts, including um, uh, uh, um, charges that were not related to obstructing the free exercise of religious beliefs. But I think it's important for, for you all to understand that one of the federal charges that he took was this one, um, because uh, his offense occurred um, at a place of worship, um, and he obstructed the exercise of those people uh, in the exercise of their religious beliefs. Um, there's another statute which uh, is interfering with federally protected rights, um, and uh, this, this statute, I'm just going to go to the bottom of that left column, deals with a victim who is engaged in protective ac protected activity. Um, so that's public education, employment, jury service, voting, travel, the enjoyment of public accommodations. So again, if you are interfering with someone's uh, exercise um, of a protected activity, because of that person's race, color, religion, or national origin, uh, then there's a federal statute that may apply, right? Um, and let me take you to an example, which may bring it home. So again, this is a, a, a story that was in the news uh, many years ago. Um, and, and again, I, I think you like, you'll, you'll remember this one. Um, Jared Loeffner, um, he goes on a shooting spree. Um, the folks that he murders um, are attending a constituent meeting um, that's being hosted by Representative uh, Gabrielle Gif Giffords in Arizona. Um, and so the protected activity, right, is it was a Know Your Congresswoman uh, 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 event that was being hosted by her. Um, and so that, that was uh, a, um, a federally protected activity that people were allowed to attend, right, um, so that they could meet their congresswoman, they could talk to her, they could be a part of um, her outreach activities. Um, that, that case ended up with uh, uh, a number of charges, um, a number of uh, uh, counts, um, and ultimately, Loeffner pled guilty to 19 charges of murder and attempted murder, um, and he's currently serving multiple life sentences. Um, right, but one of, or multiple of those charges uh, that he, one or multiple of the, the charges in the indictment was this, 18 U.S.C. 245. Um, and then finally, uh, the final statute is conspiracy against rights, and this really is, um, it's 18 U.S.C. 241. Um, this is conspiring to uh, injure, threaten, or intimidate a person uh, in the free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege secured to him or her by the Constitution or laws of the United States. All right, so again, this uh, encompasses a lot, um, and, and it allows us to uh, vindicate rights set forth in our Constitution. Um, and on this one, uh, I thought it, it might be helpful to talk to you about this Richard Tobin case. Um, this one is ongoing as well. It's a case that our office charged. Uh, Tobin uh, was a member of a, uh, it was a group that referred to themselves as the White Protection League, um, and pursuant to that group, or as a member of that group, he uh, directed others um, to vandalize minority-owned properties, including synagogues. Um, there were two synagogues that were vandalized, one in Michigan, one in Wisconsin, um, and Tobin has been charged uh, uh, in, in a conspiracy to direct others to take those actions. Um, he's been charged under this statute, 18 U.S.C. 241. And then I put up here a couple of other cases. One um, you've just heard about, right, and that was the Joseph Rubino case. Um, and so I, I don't want to take up too much time other than to say it's a really good example of uh, our office, uh, of the federal government working very closely with 
our local and state prosecutors. I mean, this case was, um, it came about as the result of great police work um, by the, the, the New Jersey State Police, by the prosecutor's office in terms of finding, locating, securing all of the evidence. Um, I know our office was in direct communication with um, the local and state folks, and ultimately we adopted that case and prosecuted uh, Mr. Rubino. Um, he, had a, he had a lot of neo-Nazi paraphernalia, um, a lot of white supremacist uh, uh, um, paraphernalia, um, and he was charged with narcotics offenses and firearms offenses. Um, and then we also have an ongoing case, uh, which is U.S. v. Joseph Triano. Um, Triano was prosecuted for conveying a bomb threat to a religious institution. That case, too, is ongoing. Um, but I mentioned both of these cases because neither of these individuals, Rubino or Triano, um, were prosecuted with actual federal hate crimes charges, right? None of the statutes that I went through here are statutes that, that, that we could use to prosecute them um, for a number of reasons, right? But there, there's no element in those statutes that, that, there's no way that they would have met every element of all of those statutes. Um, what our office, I think, historically has done and certainly is doing a lot of these days is trying to figure out what other statutes we have available to make sure that we are addressing um, this problem, right? This problem of people being radicalized, um, this problem of white supremacy, um, this problem of um, people um, uh, storing guns and bombs and other ammunition um, to take action uh, that, that, that we uh, may hear about or know about or find out about from our, our state and local law enforcement partners. And I think that's the, the thing that I want to make sure that everyone here understands is we do have a number of hate crime statutes a lot of times those are difficult to prove. A lot of times it's difficult to prove that someone actually acted on account of someone's race, right? But that doesn't necessarily stop us from prosecuting or investigating a case because we often have a number of other tools at our disposal. Um, and I know one thing that is clear in, in our office at least is that we are to use all of those tools um, to bring people to justice. Um, and so that's what we're doing here. Triano and Rubino are not charged with hate crime statutes, um, but in order to deter, in order to punish, in order to bring people to justice, we're using the tools that we have, which are narcotics and firearm statutes, um, pre predominantly. Um, okay, a typical hate crimes case, often we, we receive referrals from citizens' complaints, um, we receive referrals from our local law enforcement partners, um, and we often provide support to local law enforcement, um, and we have a strong partnership with local and state law enforcement. Um, that's through the FBI, and that's through our office. And then finally, I think this is the thing that, uh, that you've been hearing repeatedly from everybody here. Um, so I, I'm gonna echo everyone's comments with respect to saying something. Um, if you have any information, just report it, right? It, we may not be able to develop a case immediately. Um, we can't, you know, really criminalize thoughts, right? We can't prosecute people for what they think. But what we can do is put people on our radar so that we know who's out there, so that we know what they're saying. If they're posting incendiary things on Facebook, it's good for us to know about that because we can then see what they're saying, track what they're doing, figure out if there's something that we can do criminally um, if they take a step or if they take a certain act, right? So it's really critical um, for you all to take from this presentation and from every other one that you've heard today um, to talk to report things, to let us know what you're seeing. Um, I mean, I, I, I say this not glibly, you really are our first line of defense when it comes to uh, deterring um, and, and investigating and finding out what's happening out there. Um, and, and we take all of these complaints very seriously. Um, we uh, uh, investigate them thoroughly. Um, and like I said, you never know uh, when something that you say to us will help to uh, deter uh, or, uh, or, or stop something from happening in the future. So um, you've heard a lot of numbers uh, today, right? A lot of folks have given you numbers to call. Just call any of them, um, but I'll give you two more. Um, there's an FBI tip line. Call the FBI, right? Uh, it's there, um, and once you, once you call them, um, we will hear about it. If you don't want to call the FBI, um, you can call the Civil Rights Complaint Hotline. That's coming um, uh, directly to us. Um, and you can provide as much information as you can about the activity that you're seeing. Um, but I stress to you, um, and, and I know I've already done it, but I'll just do it once more. I stress to you to just say something to somebody. Um, it could be the prosecutor's office. It could be the attorney general's office. It could be our office. If you reach out to somebody, something will be done, right? Um, and, and I think that's the, the, the critical point to make here. Um, we have a number of tools at our disposal, but we can't actually use all those tools um, if we're not hearing from you about what's happening out there uh, in, in your communities. Uh, I see a hand up, and okay, sure. <laughs> I think there is a Q and A, uh, right? 
Okay, sure. Um, so as I understand the question, um, and, and I don't know that I have an answer necessarily, but um, I, I think the question is that there was a known hate group that you believe was invited here, uh, and the Attorney General's office was, was contacted and nothing was done? Is that... Okay, yeah, what, what, yeah. I will just say you should contact everyone you know I mean that's my answer to, to really and so I, I don't know the specifics of this situation but I'm giving you numbers because if you want it doesn't hurt to contact this the state and the federal law enforcement partners right um, so you should feel free to do that yes absolutely oh yeah yeah so so you can contact us with respect to stuff that's ongoing stuff that you know happened previously stuff that you believe will happen in the future right I I think what I'm saying is err on the side of reaching out. Um, you might be wrong, but I think it's better to reach out than not. I, I don't mean you specifically, but generally, right? Yeah. Did you want to jump in? All right, thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Patrick Rigby. I'm the Chief of Staff for New Jersey's Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. I work for Director Jared Maples, who's a cabinet member alongside Attorney General Graywall for Governor Murphy. Um, to dovetail off of uh, the speakers you heard tonight, I think it's uh, three critical takeaways that I'd like to touch upon, and I think that question was very uh, uh, fitting. Uh, one is reporting suspicious activity. We heard a lot of tonight about reporting bias incidents and crimes, and I think it's a nice segue to pull it together and say, where, did these, where does this information go? What are the mechanisms and reporting structures here in the state of New Jersey and throughout are 21 counties and 565 municipalities. And when you report a bias incident or a crime or report suspicious activity, all those reports are shared laterally, right? They come through the counterterrorism watch desk, uh, which is located at the ROC, the Regional Operations Intelligence Center, uh, at, uh, run by the New Jersey State Police. And that information, those reports are it, vetted in real time uh, to determine if they're uh, should be uh, directed in the, the terms of uh, the Bias Crimes Unit uh, under the Attorney General's Office, or if there's a nexus to terrorism. So if we, we mentioned uh, flyering, we mentioned uh, hateful behavior or threats, that information should absol absolutely be reported. Um, and I tell folks uh, when we're asked what is the best defense against terrorism or, or crime, and I can tell you there's no one solution. And I think our best line of defense is the community. And I say that because every day when you're out, whether there's a house of worship, you're on a campus, or you're walking around your community, knowing what is not right, you are a force multiplier. And we'd rather know about an incident than not know. We have teams of experts, we have analysts, we have law enforcement professionals. I can tell you the Attorney General mentioned the blue uniform and the gold triangles, and I can attest to you that these are some of the finest, if not the finest, law enforcement officers in the country, um, and they are very well equipped alongside our analysts to determine what that threat level is, um, all in conjunction and looking at the threat environment, by the way. Uh, the Attorney General mentioned Jersey City, um, some of the incidents that have occurred, um, and this is done in real time with the FBI. So please over-report. You are the best line of defense in your communities, and we'd rather know about something than not know about something. I believe we're going to do a Q&A session at the end. Um, the two other quick points I'd like to share uh, is the, uh, the Interfaith Advisory Council. Uh, the Attorney General made some very important points about the, the rising reporting and bias incidents and crimes. Um, there's also been incredible outreach by his office, uh, the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness, uh, New Jersey State Police, our partners on the federal level, and working with our houses of worship and our interfaith leaders. Um, several years ago, when I first started at the office, I was the director of communications. And I had the good fortune of, of working on an initiative called our Interfaith Advisory Council. And when we first started, we only had about 283 members, and that's a distinct number that stands out in my mind, 283, and only in four counties. 
and your, your county being one of them. Um, fast forward to today, we've worked with all 21 counties and our municipalities uh, across every major religion and sect. Uh, we now have over 3,500 active members across every major religion and sect, across all the counties, all the municipalities, and we meet on a quarterly basis. We meet on a quarterly basis, we talk about the challenges you're seeing in your communities, um, and after an incident we convene conference calls. So the Attorney General immediately jumps on the call, Director Maples, the Colonel of State Police, our partners at the FBI, and we find it's important to brief the interfaith leaders, community leaders, on what happened during an incident. Right? We think it's, it's imperative that uh, when we hear the rumor mills or people getting very concerned about misinformation you may hear in the news, we find it's equally important, if not more important, to make sure that you and the community are briefed in a timely manner. We have a website called the, uh, on our, our website, which is called the njohsp.gov, there's a tab, and I'll say that again, njohsp.gov, there's a tab at the top uh, we recently launched that is dedicated to the interfaith community. And on that website, you will see we provide information on reporting suspicious activities. You can do that by dialing 1-866-4-SAFE-NJ or through your local law enforcement leadership or the prosecutor's office. We want to know about that. We also highlight information regarding our grants opportunities. So providing, uh, whether it's target hardening equipment, uh, part-time armed security guards for houses of worship, there are several grant opportunities that are available to your communities that we want to make sure we get those, that, uh, those uh, informations and, and funding streams to you. Um, and lastly, I, I do want to highlight that uh, several of our folks here in the room, uh, we, we speak you know, throughout the day on a regular basis. And I can tell you, uh, being with them during the incidents that have occurred in the last several weeks, I can tell you we have one of the most impressive leadership teams um, here in the state, and I think that working with our communities, uh, working with our religious leaders, our education institutions, uh, is really going to improve in reducing the threat environment. So again, over-report, uh, we want to know about things. Please take advantage of the resources that are available in your communities. Um, and uh, please, by all means, everyone here makes themselves readily available and will make themselves available throughout the evening. Um, and thank you for your support and continued dedication. Hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Matthew Latimer. I'm with the U.S. Department of Justice Community Relations Service. And we are actually the oldest civil rights agency within the federal government. We were actually created by the 1964 Civil Rights Act to work directly with communities dealing with conflicts that are based on race, color, and national origin, as well as gender, gender identity, disability, religion, and sexual orientation. So all of our services are free of charge, they're confidential, and the services that we offer are mediation, we offer consultation, we also offer facilitation, as well as training. So in terms of, of the work that we do in New Jersey, We've actually done a number of programs focused on getting information to the community. You know, in terms of the rise of uh, bias incidents and hate crimes, just educating the community on what hate crimes are, what the resources are, uh, bringing people together for dialogue, as well as working uh, with schools uh, to educate young people, to have them uh, have, a, have a venue to talk about these difficult issues and also to uh, work on programs to make their schools better. So in terms of, of working with New Jersey, my, my area is actually New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And it's always a pleasure to come to New Jersey, not only because you have Walmart here, and we don't have that in New York, uh, <laughs> not where I live at least, but the connection between the Attorney General's office and the local prosecutor's office is so crisp. Uh, you know, a lot of the other states that I work in, and I won't mention those other states, don't have that correlation between uh, the attorney general's office, local prosecutors, local law enforcement. Uh, a lot of times it's trying to find um, a contact here or there. Um, 
you know, whichever way. But in New Jersey, there's a, a clear-cut uh, path to do that, and it's always great to work here. So in terms of reaching out to CRS, uh, you can actually go to our website. It's uh, www.justice.gov slash CRS. You'll actually see all of our programs. You'll see our contact, um, off, our contact information for the New York office, which I represent, as well as the nine other regional offices across the country. So if you have someone, say, in Philadelphia, you have someone in uh, California who's dealing with issues similar to what, what you're seeing here, you can uh, check out our website and you'll get information about that. There's also information outside on the, on the table that talks a little bit about uh, the two programs I just mentioned. One was the Protecting Places of Worship that we've actually done. Uh, we did one recently in Newark. We did one uh, in Scotch Plains uh, earlier last year as well as uh, doing a hate crimes program in, in Carteret um, to give uh, folks information. And that's actually on the table there. Um, and I think I'll stop there because I know we're going to do a little bit of a panel, so we'll have some more time for Q&A. Thank you. See, I'm psychic too. So actually, before uh, we get started with the panel, I just wanted to acknowledge a, a couple of dignitaries that didn't get mentioned initially. Uh, director, the Director of Criminal Justice, uh, Veronica Lende, uh, she is here. She came from South Jersey. Really appreciate her being here. First Assistant Attorney General De uh, Jennifer Davenport and Sergeant First Class Ryan Donnelly. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. So, folks, at, at this time, what we'd like to do is uh, turn it over to some questions that you may have. Uh, we have these fine gentlemen up here to uh, answer as best they can any questions you might have. So, um, with that, anybody have an initial question? Yes, sir. I, I could I could start off the answer to that. Um, it was I won't mention the school. My 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 son uh, in high school played football, and one of the first times going out to one of his games, I, I went into the parking lot and I saw about five or six Confederate flags hanging off the back of trucks, and it was shocking to me to see that. Uh, any any time. Um, you see a symbol like that, you always have to remember that there is a right of free expression that people have that's protected by not only the First Amendment but also the state constitution. Um, at some point, that could turn into uh, an offense at some point. So, for example, if they use that symbol to harass you or to commit some other criminal act, then that might be something that could be prosecuted. But any time you feel that there's a bias incident, feel free to contact us. But that alone, just flying a Confederate flag, would likely be protected. Does anybody disagree? No. Yeah. And, and listen, uh, offensive? I think so. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm with you. And... Um, it can be very difficult to deal with that and see those things and have to accept it knowing how it impacts certain people in our society. It's wrong, but yes? <laughs> um, I don't have any comment on that in particular. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. Yep. A, a, a flag alone, a symbol alone, without more. And, and in the fact, in the case of um, 
I, I believe there was a case involving the Ku Klux Klan uh, and also a Nazi symbol, and it is protected under the First Amendment by itself. So if nothing else is being done with it, again, it's offensive. It's something that should raise a level of concern with anyone. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It is a, it, see, and there's absolutely a line. And one thing that I, I do want to express to everybody is contact us. If there, because if, there's, if there are folks out there, you know, flaunting those types of symbols, um, as, as a law enforcement agency, do we want to know that those people exist, that they're in our community, who they are? Yes, we do. Um, I'm not saying that we're going to be able to prosecute anybody. Maybe yes, maybe no. It depends what they are doing, you know, while displaying that type of symbol. Um, but definitely something we want to know about. Yes. Yes, it, absolutely. That's correct. There, there could be... No question about it. And, so, uh, absolutely right. And so, to one of the cases, if, if you remember back, I was talking about uh, in, a fellow in our county that got uh, convicted of an offense, Michael Zaremski. And that case started because Michael Zaremski sent a swastika to his girlfriend's employer, and he knew that she worked for uh, people of the Jewish faith and heritage. And he also knew that that would get a reaction, likely get her fired. That, to me, is an act of harassment against another person. You couple that then with the symbol uh, that's being used, which make no, make no mistake what that symbol means. And there's an offense there. And there was a conviction in this county for third degree bias intimidation on the basis of that act. So, you, so Mr. Matea, you're 100% right that, that it, it's what you do in the context in which it's displayed or used. Yes? Um, for the young, probably hundreds. Uh, one, one from a recent case, Pepe the Frog. Are you familiar with Pepe the Frog? Anybody? Definitely the younger people. Uh, I, I had no idea that that was a racist symbol until I got involved with the Michael Zaremski case. And then you started to see the context in which Pepe the Frog was being used, and it was pretty clear, okay, that particular meme has been co-opted. You know, it's been, it's been taken over uh, by right-wing groups. And, and they can do that with almost anything, right? I mean, so, yeah. The okay, and it's usually like down like that, yeah. like with the fingers down. Yeah. Anybody? <laughs> well, go ahead. You want to jump in? No, no. Go ahead. Sure. So, I mean, in terms of the the uh, symbols that you're describing, um, whether they're affiliated with hate groups or terrorist groups, or uh, we actually on our website we have products that are publicly available that we put out. They're not classified for the public, 
And one of the products that we recently published was specifically on this topic. And we put it out also in our annual threat assessment that will be coming out in the next couple of weeks um, that actually looks at all the different groups and some of those symbols that are uh, mischaracterized, perverted, or misconstrued. Uh, one of the examples that came up uh, historically, I was reminded Bob Wilson's in the office, a member uh, here tonight uh, from the Jewish Federations. We were having a conversation before about um, the swastika and how it really was originally a symbol uh, that had a different meaning and one of uh, uh, actually the opposite connotation. And over time, that was used right. in a different context. And you mentioned Pepe the Frog. There's also other symbols um, in terms. And I, I just don't want to use the uh, have everybody focus on, on symbols. There's also terms um, that are used as well, and we actually highlight uh, several of those that have become known to us over time. Um, so I would encourage you to take a look at that. Um, it'll answer some of the questions that you alluded to um, in terms of instances they've been um, used both here in New Jersey or elsewhere around the country. Um, and if you see it on social media or you, you hear it around your community, please, please report it or, or help us become aware of it by all means. So it's uh, New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. It's njohsp.gov. And we have an entire um, uh, category dedicated to domestic extremism. And we call it DT, or also homegrown violent extremist, HBEs. Um, and then any type of, we classify a lot of these groups as HBEs. So it's all available on the website. I if you want to add. Yes, sir. You have to understand also, a lot of the signs, especially the juveniles, they're used out of ignorance, some of them. You know, I, I know in the high schools we used to go to different talks with regards to gangs, and they would be doing the signs of gangs, what they were, thinking that they were cool. And if they walked out of Newark and did those signs, they probably were subject to getting killed. But they weren't part of the gangs. They weren't. Well, and, It can be, and we have to investigate. It's supposed to be yeah. something common knowledge, so that when somebody says, are you being a white supremacist, it's like, oh, no, no, it's just a joke, when in reality, that's almost like a code. But it, it can be terminology, it can be yeah. symbols, it can be movies and pictures, yeah. and like, yeah. not for nothing, it's like, when I was 13, Pepe was not a white supremacist. Correct. Person, right. But a gay flag on frog, and they'd be like, oh, my God. Yeah, they'd been yeah. hijacked. They've hijacked innocent things to make them part of their group. But not everyone who uses it. There may be some that do. But that's what makes it difficult. Again, as they talked earlier about the thoughtfulness, it's difficult for us to be able to say that someone is doing it for that purpose. Now, part of the investigation is us to find out and for us to get all the information and collect it.
it may not be just one time, it may be multiple times. And it may be being done in certain areas that we know that we can now be able to use circumstantial evidence that it is being directed at a certain group or being directed at a certain person that we're able to do harassment or bring those charges up. Okay? So that's why we do. Again, I don't think any of us on the panel, all of us that have spoken, um, can emphasize enough getting the information in. Um, to a degree, I think that's why somewhat New Jersey's numbers, as the Attorney General spoke about, our numbers of reported incidents are 300% up. But part of that is because we are asking you to tell us. Let us look at that. And you may not know all that goes behind the investigation or what has been looked into, because a lot of that happens. And then the state, they have, that nat have our statewide database that all the prosecutors and law enforcement are able to use and we're able to follow up on it. So I appreciate it. We appreciate you bringing it to our attention and we will continue to follow up. Yes, sir. Yeah, we talk a lot about symbols and flags and all that other stuff. And that's been going on since I was here a long time ago. Most folks are here, I think, because if you take the flag away, there's always a cache of weapons nowadays. These people are armed with these people, and they're more than willing and emboldened to use them. Which brings me to an issue that's going on around Sussex County as uh, it concerns the recently passed gun legislation. The extreme risk protection order, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, let, let me, and it's a little bit, you know, off topic for tonight, but one thing that I do want to tell you about that, because it's, it's important, we are talking about it as, as a community right now. Uh, the, the, the prosecutor, the prosecutor's office, we are 100% uh, committed to enforcing the red flag laws. We will enforce uh those laws um so period And, you know, as Attorney General mentioned, and, and anybody who's dedicated their career to law enforcement, I, he said it perfectly when he said, you know, every night when I go to bed, I think about community safety. When I wake up, I think about community safety. It's always in your mind. It really is. We care about this community. We care about the safety of this community. That's a safety issue for this community. I promise you that law will be enforced. I promise you. All right? Yes. That, that, it's a really good question. I'm going to turn it over to the group in a second, especially uh, with the interfaith. But I, I just want to highlight an issue that's raised by that question. It's a really good question because with houses of worship, synagogues, churches, mosques, it's very difficult, right? Because they're, in a sense, soft targets because they want to be welcoming, right? You don't, you don't want to have armed guards at the gate. Um, by the same token, though, they're a target. So you got to keep folks safe. It's, it's a very difficult uh, dilemma. We, we, our office, we're working with uh, religious leaders in, in the county. We're going to be meeting with them shortly to talk about that very issue. It's been an ongoing dialogue, something we care a lot about lo here locally. But let me turn it over to Homeland Security on that. That's a great question. So uh, there's no one solution is the answer. There are multiple solutions in the toolbox. So. The prosecutor can attest to this. Uh, there are folks that are dedicated regional risk mitigation planners, RMPs, that work in lockstep with the prosecutor's office. They're members of our team and our critical infrastructure bureau who are specifically assigned to going out to houses of worship and doing facility site assessments. And we said before there's no one solution, one fit-all solution. 
And that's because it's dependent upon what that facility blueprint is. So how many access points are there, right? How many congregants are there? Um, how many folks are coming in and out? How many services are happening on a daily basis? Uh, are there existing cameras, locks, lights, and doors, right? So to simply say um, locks are the solution, I, I can't, I would never tell anyone that. I wouldn't say, um, is it, you know, more cameras? That's not necessarily true either. It's, it's a whole of community, whole of government approach, and I think they're tailored specific to each house of worship. So again, I really encourage if there's a specific institution or house of worship you have in mind, the prosecutor's office can put you in touch with someone from their team. They actually come out and put site assessments uh, together for you, and that is actually the first step. We talked about grant dollars before for houses of worship. In order to apply for those grants, you need to complete a facility site assessment. And that score, that risk assessment, is then used to apply to both state and federal funding. So again, prosecutor's office, my office, we're, we're all happy to help. That's a good question. Anybody else? Sure, and one thing I'll, I'll also add in terms of the Community Relations Service, one thing that we've been doing uh, across numerous counties actually in New Jersey and also in New York are uh, protecting places of worship forums, which is kind of one-stop uh, shop that talks about hate crimes law from, from the federal as well as the local level. We also have uh, the FBI to come in and do an overview of an active shooter training. So actually talking through um, you know, what to do in that type of situation, what you can do. And then also having uh, FEMA come in and talk about some of the grants that are available as well as uh, Homeland Security and Preparedness as, uh, as well as local prosecutors. So that you kind of, uh, you can do this for your community so that uh, folks can come in and get a sense of what's available for them. That's great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, and I know that's an issue. It is. You know, we want to respect the First Amendment, and yet what they say is offensive, as offensive as the flags that we're talking about. Um, what does that point do in terms of law enforcement, in terms of colleges and universities? Is that for the law enforcement? Yeah. Both of us have uh, college age kids, so let me tell you, these guys are not shy. So a lot of times when these controversial speakers will come in, a lot of times they're getting shut down because of a safety issue, right? I mean, the, the, people are going to riot if so-and-so gets to spout off 
certain things in a public setting. It's not going to happen. So, um, and you, you also have to distinguish between a public college where there is First Amendment protection versus a private university where they, they can allow or disallow who they want. Um, so, yes, I think this may be the last one. So just so, I don't want to put pressure on you, but. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Right. Yes. I know what you're saying. Top yeah. one more, or and Greg, and that's why uh, one thing that we found, in, you know, to add on what the prosecutor said, is that even with swastikas, we find that there's a lot of kids that don't understand the meaning behind it. They're doing it because it looks right. like it's cool, you know. So that, that's where education is such an important feature, and you know, um, as the attorney general mentioned earlier, that's you know one of the areas that we hope to address in the future is educating kids on you know, what's right and what's wrong and, and that sort of thing, so. I want to thank everyone for coming. Thank you. Um, again, as I started off this evening, this is not an end, it's a conversation. It's a constant communication between our community, law enforcement, civil rights, everyone. It's the only way we can attack it. Um, unfortunately, tragic events happen. The only thing, some of the positive out of some of the tragedies, it unites us to see that we are stronger together against hate than hate is. And as the Attorney General said, you have to learn to hate. Um, if you, there's a YouTube uh, commercial on or YouTube video just recently, and it just happened to be a, a white boy and a little black boy, an African-American child. And they run together when they see each other. And the absolute joy and love that they have for one another, right? That's what we want everyone to be, regardless of your race, your religion. That is what our communities need to be. So thank you. God bless. And please be safe. <laughs>